Welcome to the Warren Files. Presenting true insights and experiences from the paranormal world. With your host, Chris McKinnell, director of the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. Hello, and welcome back to the Warren Files. I'm your host, Chris McKinnell, the director of the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. And today, I am with Karen Tibbetts-Williams. You are in for such a treat today. Karen is a fantastic researcher, head of Haunted New Zealand in Auckland, New Zealand. She's a Wiccan witch, and she's also um, an Oxford University graduate. She has a, quite a pedigree, an amazing bunch of stories, and we're going to learn an awful lot about Wicca, witchcraft, how they are different, how they are the same, how they work together. We're going to talk about egregores and different cases that she's worked on. Karen, thank you so much for being on. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's a real pleasure to, to talk to you. Uh, well, you know, we've just been chatting for the past hour before we started our <laughs> podcast. And I have to say, I wish I had recorded the whole thing and we could be talking <laughs> for hours. <laughs> I think we could, definitely. <laughs> so how how on earth did you get started in this field? I love to ask that question first. Oh, gosh. Um, I think... <laughs> I think probably it goes back to my earliest experiences of, of growing up in a haunted house. Uh, so my parents built a house. Oh, where was this? Mm. Oh, this was in England. So originally, originally I'm from England. I lived in England most of my life. Uh, and then I moved to New Zealand when I was around, oh, gosh, 31. <laughs> so, yeah, probably about yeah 30 odd years in England and now coming up for about 15 years in New Zealand and now you all know how old I am <laughs> <laughs> so uh when I was in England my ha my parents built this beautiful brand new house uh next to a 200 year old uh derelict windmill which we originally planned to live in as well um and so living in this house, I had so many experiences with the paranormal. Um, we saw apparitions in the house. Things would go missing from where you'd left them, only to reappear in the place that they were before. Um, certain rooms in the house would give you a really creepy, ominous feeling. Um, there was a real feeling of tension in the rooms, and you got the sense that if you didn't get out of the room really quickly, something very bad was going to happen. So I think that really made me aware of dimensions other than our own. Um, and I'd been raised Catholic um, up until I was 13 and I took my confirmation. Um, my mum then gave me the choice of going to church or not going to church and I chose not to go to church. Um, but it gave me kind of a good spiritual background and I think that, that those... Um, formative experiences really piqued my interest in the paranormal and and made me want to understand more about it. Uh, and then when I moved to New Zealand, uh, I'm kind of skipping ahead here a bit, uh, and I was getting a formal training as a witch. Um, that made me want to enter paranormal investigation because it, it would enable me not only to learn, but also to be able to help people as well. So... For people who don't understand, <clears throat> I mean, this is a brand new home. Why do you yeah. suppose uh, there were hauntings in a brand new home? I think what that experience has taught me is that a haunting or activity in a property really isn't necessarily to do with the very fabric of the building itself or anything that's necessarily happened there before. It can be a function of the land that it's built on or, or something that happened on the land or in that area or even perhaps a building that stood there previously. Um, the home that I lived in was built on the site of two ancient stone-built barns, which would have been used for storing flour or wheat for the windmill. Um, when they dug the foundations of the home, they actually discovered a well where the kitchen ended up being too. So there was a, an ancient well there as well. Um, the the road that it was built on is actually a Roman road 
um, very straight road. If you if you follow it with a ruler on a map, it goes directly to where they built Peterborough Cathedral. So it was, you know, it's very historic land. There would have been lots of things that happened there. Um, I know that there was also, I know now, that there was a suicide on the property at some point too. So despite the fact that it was a new home, it didn't stop it from being haunted. Right. And, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times people will say that they see a ghost floating above them or or they only see half a ghost because it's in the floor. And that's because for that spirit, they're actually on the floor of the building that they inhabited. They're not yeah. on your floor. Absolutely. Now, strangely, I actually saw a figure going up the stairs of the building that my parents built. I don't know how that works. Um, at the time, I thought it was my sister um, because this I, I was walking across the landing. It was an enormous landing. It was, it was like, a, like the size of a room. Um, and I was walking across the landing from my mum and dad's room kind of directly towards mine, which was right in front of me. Out the corner of my eye on the left, I saw this figure going up the stairs. And I can still see it now in my mind's eye. One hand on the handrail, the banister going up the stairs. And this thing walked into my sister's room. Now, I didn't look at it directly. I just assumed that it was her. And I'm in my room going, dawn, dawn, dawn. And she was, wasn't answering me. Um, so I went into her room. She wasn't there. I went downstairs. She was snuggled up on the sofa with my gran. And I said, I was talking to you. <laughs> you. You know, you were ignoring me. And she didn't have a clue what I was on about. She hadn't <laughs> been upstairs. Nobody had been upstairs. <laughs> and whoever it was that I saw going upstairs wasn't my sister. But it was just interesting, you know, talking about what you say, you know, seeing half a ghost or seeing a ghost in the wrong place. This one managed to be perfectly aligned on the staircase and use the handrails. <laughs> I, would I don't know how that works. Manifesting for you. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? My sister saw no. a figure running through that, uh, through, the, the, through the downstairs level of the same building, actually. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the Roman road. I had an experience yes. with my grandmother. Uh, for people who don't know, that's Lorraine Warren. And um, we were in England at a pub, and we were having lunch, and she looked out the window, and she said she saw a whole bunch of Roman soldiers marching by, but she could only see them from the chest up. And she mentioned it to the lady wow. who owned the pub, and she said, well, yeah, that's because the Roman road is out there about three or four feet uh, mm -hmm. underneath the current road. Amazing. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty good. That's great, isn't it? <laughs> but then so, that, uh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say it kind of it could feed into the theory of um, some paranormal activity or hauntings or ghosts being almost like a tape recording. Absolutely. Um, residual perhaps. hauntings. That's residual the difference, hauntings. I think, right there. When you saw that, that girl on the stairs, that was an actual haunting, whereas often what you're seeing is only a... a uh, an impression, a psychic impression, and that's why, for instance, in in England, uh, in the dungeons, you'll hear that moaning and the chains and everything. But there's no actual <laughs> spirit there. It's just that the horrific things that took place there left an impression on the land, exactly. on the stone. Stone seems to pick up these psychic impressions far better than like wood does. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. I couldn't say why. Just, it's something I've noticed. It might be something to do with crystalline structure. or <clears throat> That's true. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> we could go off on a whole new theory about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we've been doing that for the past hour before this. We have. <laughs> so, um, now you are a Wiccan witch. That's right. What is, what is, let's, before we get into the difference between Wicca and witchcraft, can you tell people who are not, really familiar with Wicca, what is it and what's its history? Okay, so um, witchcraft obviously has been around probably since there were people in mm -hmm. one form or another and, and historically um, people who are now called witches would have been maybe the wise woman of the village, the, um, the midwife, the healer, um, the woman that... I, I say woman, and I, and I don't mean that in a in a sexist sense. You could be male, female, or 
you know, non-binary gender <laughs> to be a witch. You know, that's the gender isn't important. Historically, it was traditionally a woman's role. Um, right. So I don't well, want to offend anybody because, by saying that. But <laughs> well, in hunter-gatherer societies, the hunters were the men, the gatherers were the women, the women were the ones that's who right. carried the knowledge of the. The, the abilities of plants and pass those down to their daughters. So exactly. yeah, that, that was the origin as far as I can figure out. I mean, as yeah. far as I can tell, witchcraft is the original religion and it's been around about 35,000 years or longer. Yeah. So, so, so that would have been the, the traditional um, role of a, of, of a witch um, within society. And obviously then people became persecuted for some of those skills. It, and it, it was very much kind of kept underground, you know. You didn't want to, uh, you didn't want to risk your life uh, for your beliefs or your practices. Right. So, so there was a, a lot of secrecy around that. Um, in the 1950s, uh, an Englishman by the name of Gerald Gardner created what we now know as modern Wicca. And he, almost single-handedly, but not actually single-handedly, um, developed this uh, um, more formal um, spirituality, if you will, around witchcraft and and led to its popular resurgence. So he, he wrote books, Witchcraft Today is probably his most famous um, book on Wicca. Um, and yeah, and, and so he developed this whole new, I don't like to call it a religion, spiritual belief system of Wicca. So uh, Wicca, Wicca now has two branches. You have Gardnerian Wicca and you have Alexandrian Wicca. So Gardnerian Wicca is, is Gerald Gardner's original Wicca. If you are a Gardnerian witch, you have been initiated into the tradition by a high priest or a high priestess um, who has been initiated by another high priest or high priestess. And you can track that line all the way directly back to Gerald Gardner. That makes you a Gardnerian witch. Mm -hmm. If you're an Alexandrian witch, uh, your lineage goes back to Alexander, who actually was a Gardnerian witch, but there was just kind of an offshoot at some point. So now there's two traditions of Wicca, <laughs> Alexandrian and Gardnerian. And who is Alexander? So he was a, he was a, a student of um, Gerald Gardner, and they had a bit of a difference of opinion at some point. <laughs> These <laughs> things happen, egos and... <laughs> of course, yeah. What have you? Yeah, and I, I know that um, Gerald Gardner took about 20 years to put this together. He started in the 30s um, studying and working with witches and learning everything he could. It, it wasn't as if he just came up with this overnight. No, that's right. And he, he was uh, himself the student of lots of other traditions and he borrowed heavily from them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, he borrowed from the Golden Dawn uh, tradition of magic, for example. And there's actually quite a lot of... Um, of that in Wicca in the teachings and, you know, little bits from Crowley here and there. <laughs> uh, it all, it, you know, he, he, he was quite shameless in, in, in where he took his inspiration from. But I think um, for me, in any case, I think that's kind of part of not only the charm of it, but the power of it as well. Sure. I think there's Wisdom's a lot to be everywhere. said for, exactly. And walking a trodden path, you know, um, energetically speaking, if you're doing things which have been performed by many people before you, there's a power to that. So what is the difference, really, between Wicca and witchcraft in practice? I think that's a great question. Um, in practice, uh, all Wiccans are witches, but not all witches are Wiccan. So um, you get a lot of people that say that they're Wiccan, but they're not. They're actually a witch. Um, you have to have a proper lineaged initiation to be a Wiccan. You cannot self-initiate into Wicca. You can self-initiate as a witch. Um, now, one isn't superior to the other. They're just different. One's an initiatory tradition and the other is a non-initiatory tradition, or it can be a self-initiatory tradition. If you choose to initiate, you don't have to. In practice, very little difference, really. <laughs> uh, people who, who call themselves a witch, um, 
maybe they may be a kitchen witch or they may, may be a garden witch or they may you know they may be a healer it depends uh, you know it depends what people's own personal interests are oftentimes you know people go out and learn about lots of different things whether that's divination healing you know what have you and then tend to focus on the things either that they're good at or that they enjoy the most so for people who don't know what do you mean by kitchen witch or garden witch so people manifest their craft in 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 very different and very personal ways um some people show their love and work their magic in the kitchen so that would be the person for example that cooks you up the most incredible batch of chicken soup and brings it over to you while you're poorly they're healing you they're putting love into the food that they're making hold for on. you it's it's hold on a moment it's karen, create- karen yeah. i yes. lost you for a second you lost me uh, for a second we're gonna we're gonna cut and um okay edit that part out and okay. go to um that's the person who brings chicken soup over to you when you're ailing okay all right so that's the person that brings chicken soup over for you when when you're poorly to make you better so that person is a healer they're creating for you food which is made with love and made with the intention of healing you and making you well and and that's a powerful way to to work magic you can work magic in the kitchen by the way that you cook and prepare food and give it to others i mean feeding people is a real act of love feeding somebody because they're poorly and you want to make them better is also an act of magic so but it's that, that would focused be an, intent that's important isn't it it's the focused intent that's everything yeah absolutely and what is a garden witch somebody who works with herbs yeah absolutely so um they might um manifest their magic by by growing particular kinds of herbs or plants they might use those herbs and plants as a they might be growing for example there are there are plants and herbs which are grown by mars for example um plants and herbs uh, which are sacred to hecate so so the the act of growing things may be a devotion in itself but then the use of those herbs um either in spells potions um or other um magic crafting could be part of that too mm-hmm. but you know there are they're kind of an, an earthy grounded witch who who likes to get their hands in the soil and feel that connection with the earth and, it seems to me that, that that's almost the origin of chemistry that's an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, obviously, there's far more to it, but when when you get down to the yeah. basic mixing and looking for the 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 power of these items, mm. it's similar. Well, it's certainly medicine. Absolutely, it's certainly medicine. You're growing with intent, and you're creating something with an intent to heal. For example, that's that's medicine, isn't it? Absolutely. So you um. You had quite a number of experiences in England, but then you came to New Zealand where you really got into this. That's right, yeah. I um, I started um, training formally as a witch in New Zealand uh, with a high priest and high priestess actually from England. And, and <laughs> my high priestess I actually knew from England. I just didn't know that she was a witch at the time. She happened to have moved over to New Zealand. I reconnected with her. And, uh, and then I kind of began formal training with them. And as I, as I progressed with that, and it, it, believe me, it's a slow process and there's a huge amount of work that's involved. It doesn't come from free. Uh, you're expected to, you're kind of pointed in the right direction and then let loose to make your own discoveries and report back. So you're not spoon fed the information that you're given when you receive formal training in Wicca. It's, it's very much a very much a case of just being guided to, to find the information for yourself. As that progressed, um, part, of, part of what you learn um, are things like psychic self-defense, um, removing curses, cursing as well, um, being able to, to channel energy for, for healing or for harm, 
or for you know any purpose that you might want to use it. And I, I was particularly interested in, um, p- perhaps due to my experiences when I was younger, particularly interested in, um, in when, when I was learning about house clearings, you know, removing energies and entities from houses. And, and I was taught that, you know, it's my duty to society to use those skills and abilities that I have to help people, that I have almost an obligation to do so and to do so free of charge as well that you know these these gifts which were given to me these teachings um you know the gift of the knowledge that I've been given and and the skills as well and abilities that I was born with were not given to me as a means to earn a living but they were given to me as a means to help other people right and that I should and that I should use those abilities for that purpose (laughs) so I really wanted to be able to do that. But then the question is, how do you do that? You know, how can people find you? (laughs) How do they know where to come? You have to somehow put yourself out there. And that's what led me to paranormal investigation. Uh, A friend of mine mentioned that they had been out with a local paranormal investigation team. Um, I was fascinated and wanted to know more about it and ended up getting in touch um, and becoming involved with them myself. So, um, yeah, that's how that started. And that was great because that really put me in a place where I could help. You had an interesting case in Auckland with a a Maori woman. We did, yeah. Um, (laughs) It's probably the the most interesting case um, that I've been involved with to date, I think. It's certainly certainly my favourite one, I think. (laughs) Um, It was was somewhat unexpected. We went to a, it was almost a mansion, it was the most enormous house, so many bedrooms. It was being rented by a family in Auckland and they had been having all sorts of trouble with the house. They were um, getting bad feelings in some of the rooms. They were seeing shadows moving. The lights were blowing up. Um, they were replacing about 10 light bulbs a week, I think they said to us. Um, the baby, who was two years old, would not go into its own room and would scream and scream and scream if someone tried to take the baby into its own bedroom. Um, and they had some, they were subletting as well. So they, they had some, the tenants had tenants of their own. And they were living downstairs, and then they were having huge problems in their part of the house. What kind of problems? People were, people were absolutely terrified to be in, in a couple of the rooms there. So there was one girl there who was a Maori woman. Um, she was 24 at the time. Very, very lovely, sweet, unassuming, level-headed person. A professional woman. I think she had a, a good job not somebody who would be prone to hysteria or attention seeking you know she she would just seem very much a victim in all of this and she was really being bothered so she was going to sleep every night and her she would shut her bedroom door as she went to sleep and this door which you know it fitted well um, and it was a heavy door but this door would come open every single night by itself um, and it was bothering her uh, and, you know, she was having bad feelings. She was really unhappy. They, the family as a whole and their um, tenants paid for somebody to come in and do a cleansing oh. on the house. <laughs> um, and they paid a fortune. They paid several hundred dollars to this person who I can only assume was a complete charlatan. I don't know what his process was. But uh, other than taking a huge amount of money from them, he also demanded dinner and a ride home again afterwards. <laughs> but unfortunately, whatever he did in the property didn't help. In fact, it was just the opposite. It made it worse. So the activity in the home was intensifying immediately after this guy's visit uh, to the extent that this young woman took it upon herself to, po- to perform a Maori um, blessing in her room so she she blessed some water and sprinkled the water and she re- recited a karakia which is a prayer a maori prayer and as she was taking the water back up the stairs of this home to you know clean up and put the things away she felt uneasy as she was going up the stairs and to such an extent that she actually turned around and looked behind her and she saw the spirit of a man walking closely behind her up the stairs and she was absolutely terrified to the extent that she then went and sorry it's 
big lorry going past there. Sorry about that. Um, to the extent that she slept on the couch after that point. Um, so she was terrified. Everything had got worse. And um, they called in the team that I was with. Right. So, and then, you know, that happens a lot when somebody comes in and they do a failed cleansing or even when I get called before I get there, things intensify because the spirits yeah. know we're they coming know. <laughs> and they're like, well, we're going to we're going to stop you from coming. We're going to intimidate this family so that they don't ask for more help. They do. I have to tell you a story about a time that I cleansed a place before I got there or before the team got there, um, which was by accident, but yeah, I ruined the investigation, but I performed the cleansing without actually physically being present. We'll talk about story. that after, after this case. <laughs> uh, so I went into this home and, uh, and, and did an investigation. I, I was sitting on her bed for a time on my own and I'd, I'd shut the door. I had put my, um, I'd put a, my camera on the bed. I got my voice recorder there and I was just talking to the room. Um, and, and then at some point I said, is it you who opens the door? Are you the spirit who is opening the door of this room? And this is all caught on video. You can actually watch this for yourself. And the camera's pointing at the door. There's seven seconds between me answering this question. And all of a sudden, there's this really loud click as the door unlatches from the hinge and it, um, from the, the latch. And it, uh, and it goes click, click. Click, 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 click. And this door swings open by itself. Nobody on the other side of it. You can see down the corridor from where I was sitting. There was nobody there. This, this door kind of almost opened on command, which was mm -hmm. kind of interesting. So there was no wind or the doors, windows and everything were shut. It was cold. There's, it hadn't blown open. And we tested the door, you know. It, was, it wasn't something that would, would, would have been an easy thing um, just for the door to open by itself and certainly impossible when it's shut properly and, and latched as it was. So, uh, so I performed a cleansing on the house. Um, typically, I would begin a cleansing um, using all of the elements. So um, by blessing and cleansing some water and by blessing some salt, mixing the two to make um, what's effectively holy water um, and, and sprinkling that around the house uh, with intent. <laughs> As we were saying, intent is everything. So with the intent... Absolutely. Of, of removing negative energies and entities from the home, and then going around and burning sage with the same, you know, with the same intent, of purifying the energy of the home and removing negativity. So we did that. We then followed that up with um, ringing Tibetan tingsha bells. Um, you posted a really nice article the other day about um, demons and bells. Mm -hmm. So that's that was quite good. We did that too, um, and then just simply because of the extent of the activity that's in the home and I haven't even covered everything that was going on there uh, it, I felt that it needed something more powerful now oftentimes a basic cleansing is fine this felt like it was just going to need something a bit more so right. I performed the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram and what is that in the home so the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram I believe originates from the golden dawn tradition of magic it's a piece of ceremonial magic which is performed in Hebrew um, and it's done loudly so they use they use the instruction to vibrate the words so so you're intoning them as loudly as you possibly can um, with the visualization that as you intone these um, sacred names that this uh, set vibration of sound and intent is, is kind of almost traveling all the way across the universe and coming and hitting you in the back of the head that you know it's, it's traveling out there um, in every direction mm -hmm. so you start off by um, performing um, Artur, Malkut, Vega Buddha, Vega Dulla, Leolam, Amen, which is, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, Amen. And as you do that, you're draw, you, beforehand you connect to the, the white divine light. I think I heard you call it the Christ light recently. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, that um, pure white energy and light of love and perfection perhaps from which we all come in the first place and you draw that down through yourself so you're drawing it from above down through yourself you're becoming a channel for this energy and filling yourself with this energy so you do that to begin with and then you create um, four pentagrams 
at each of the corners. And as you do that, you um, you intone, you vibrate for uh, sacred names of deity, uh, Yahovah, Ahie, Adonai, Agla. So you do that at each of the corners. And as you do that, you, you're physically blasting um, through the center of each pentagram, any negativity, negative energy, entities, whatever, pretty much just everything gets blasted out through these pentagrams, which are linked by a circle of glowing light, which you're visualizing as you do it. Um, and you then invoke the four archangels. So Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, Uriel, you bring those energies into it as well. So they're all around you. Uh, and then you perform um, the Kabbalistic cross again as you did at the beginning, at the mm -hmm. end. And this literally um, erases everything from the area. I mean, it's, um, it's kind of a bit like setting off a flea bomb <laughs> in a house, right. <laughs> to, give you a, to give you an analogy, you know? It's gonna, if you're a little bug that's walking around in the house when that flea bomb goes off, it doesn't matter whether you're a flea or not, you're gone. So, and, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I've worked with uh, groups, that, uh, Christian groups, that do something extremely similar uh, where they'll all visualize together this the white light just blowing up inside of the home and exploding all the energy out. And it, it's all about that focus and intention through ritual that makes all of this happen. And this way, your way, is such a beautiful way. For people who don't understand about pentagrams, you know, because, of course, there, there's a certain prejudice there. The reality is, if it's one point up, it, it it's a good thing. If it's two points up, it's supposed to represent Satanism because it looks like a goat. It, um, it doesn't actually, though. Interestingly enough, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, the 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 point each each one of the points of the pentagram represents a different element. So as you go around the pentagram, you have um, air, earth, fire, water, and spirit. Right. And when the pentagram is point up. Um, spirit is at the top so it represents the dominion of spirit over the earthly element so you're kind of recognizing divinity in in that pentagram so you could understand that when it's reversed people think that that means that it's satanic um, it, it doesn't actually mean that <laughs> there is a it, it, the, the inverted pentagram um, is, is actually used to represent one of the degrees of wicker as well and um there you know there is something to be said for embracing your earthly incarnation Certainly. um and and it you know <laughs> even <laughs> though people like you and i are spending our time on earth trying to connect with other dimensions and, <laughs> and understand them and dealing with <laughs> which kind of seems a bit ironic um you know, well, we I think are that's the whole the purpose of our incarnation is to well, I think work our us, way certainly. back. Yeah, absolutely. We are spiritual beings experiencing an, an earthly physical existence at the moment. Some of us remain fascinated with the spiritual realms, and you know, so this is what we do. Um, but you know, there is a there is a, a benefit to embracing the the physical and um, the tangible side of the universe. It's good and, to have a balance. Yeah, absolutely. So an inverted pentagram may be used in Satanism, um, but just because a pentagram is inverted doesn't make it inherently evil. So people no, shouldn't have well, any fear I, around that. What I was that. referring to is the, um, the misappropriation and the fact that this is what it does represent for the general public today. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and people do have some misunderstanding and fear around that symbol. Which is why we're here. To try and just why we're here. Absolutely. Now, I was telling you about the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, the uh, cleansing that I was doing in the home. So I performed this ritual. And uh, what happened after that point uh, was that things seemed to take a dramatic turn. And uh, I performed the, the ritual kind of as much in the center of the home as, as I could. And as I was visualizing it, I was visualizing my um, my circle and my pentagrams to be at the periphery of the property so that it would be cleansing the entire property and the land as I was doing it. Uh, and everybody was gathered round to 
kind of witness the ritual um, and just kind of be part of it by by being present. And the the Maori woman uh, was sitting on the stairs at the time that I performed the ritual. And after I performed the ritual, I got my um, my my sensor, which I was burning. I think I had been burning sage in there earlier in the evening. I think I'd switched over to some frankincense just because it's kind of a nice positive vibration that it brings. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of cleaning all of that out. I was packing up my stuff. I was getting ready to go. And there was a bit of a commotion on the stairs. And it appears to all intents and purposes that what may have begun as a spirit which was attached to this woman had then become a spirit which was possessing her because she could she couldn't speak um she mm. couldn't move she couldn't she she became completely helpless so her mum and her auntie had come to the property to support her during this ritual and the cleansing and they they were calling for me and they were leading her up the stairs and they kind of sat her down on the sofa um and at this point i realized that it's all on me you know i'm gonna have to deal with this now <laughs> here's the situation that we're in now sort it out karen okay so um so she sat on the sofa and and I begin to think about, you know, how, how's the best way to deal with this? Because, of course, the one thing that you can't do is look frightened. <laughs> uh, right. You know, you're, you're the one person that everybody's relying on to deal with this situation. So, you know, make it look like you know what you're doing and don't show any fear because, you know. Sometimes otherwise... <laughs> the only faith that our clients have is in us. Exactly. And I, I mean, you know, I, I was confident that I could deal with this. What I didn't know was exactly how I was going to go about doing it. So um, I always travel with um, with a kind of kit of equipment for dealing with emergencies. I just hadn't had any emergencies up to this point. So, so I was prepared um, physically, if not psychologically, for the situation. Um, now, I had made many, many moons prior a batch of psychic protection oil. Um, now, I can actually... Um, dig out the recipe for that and share that with um, you if you want for yes, that would be to be wonderful. able to use it. So I'd made this psychic protection oil, which was made with a variety of herbs and oils and crystals. Um, and it's a very grounding oil. So obviously, you know, if you've been taken over by spirit, you're not grounded at that point. So grounding being an important part of the process. So I anointed her body, um, obviously, you know, letting her know exactly what it was, you know, even though she really wasn't or didn't appear to be present in the moment, I still wanted to, you know, talk to her and reassure her that, you know, everything's okay. This is under control. This is what I'm using. This is why I'm using it. And this is what I'm going to do. You know, obviously I don't want to start touching her without her permission. So, um, so I anointed her forehead and her wrists, I think her feet as well, I anointed with this oil. And I brought with me um, a couple of crystals. So I had a black tourmaline, which is fabulous for mm -hmm. absorbing negative energy. And I bought a selenite as well. Her selenite is a very high vibration, very pure crystal of kind of light and, and love and purity. So... It seemed to me that the, the kind of the contrast of those two would work really well in this situation. So I, I put those crystals, um, one in each of her hands, and I put the uh, I put the tourmaline into her left hand. So that's her uh, her receptive hand. Um, let me get that right. Uh, no, the other way around. <laughs> I knew I'd gone wrong there. I put the tourmaline into her right hand. So that was her her kind of hand of, you know, power, the the, the hand um, you know, the hand that most of us write with. Your left hand is kind of more of your passive receiving hand. So that was the hand that I put the sealer knight into. Um, so the, the the hand that's kind of giving stuff out has got the tourmaline into it to to absorb negativity, and the receptive hand can can absorb the vibrations from the sealer knight that you know so she can raise her vibration. Right. And so then she had the crystals in her hand and, I, and she was sitting on the sofa and I knelt down in front of her and I took hold of both of her hands in mine. So I took her right hand in and, and I wish I could Aaron, adequately Aaron, describe to you Aaron, the experience that I... Oh, Aaron. Yeah. Am I breaking up? Yeah, you I'm still here. for a moment. Okay. Uh, go, go back to... Um, so you put the selenite in her 
uh, now I'm lost, left or right hand? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, so I was talking about. So I took her hands in mine. Should we go back to? Sure. Yeah. I only lost you for about five, ten seconds. Okay. So, so I took her hands in mine, and and I I knelt down in front of her. So I had her left hand in my right hand, and her right hand was in my left hand, and and I wish I could adequately describe to you the sensation that I felt as I took her hands because it was a physical sensation it wasn't it wasn't a psychic or a spiritual sensation it was a physical sensation and and it was like an electrical current it was it was almost like sticking your fingers into an electrical socket this feeling of electricity which which I got from touching her hands so I, I could feel this thing that was that was on her or in her um, and it was my belief that it in order to escape this cleansing it literally kind of you know taken root inside of her to hide from this lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram that I'd done so as I as I held her hands I decided that the most effective way for me to get rid of this thing was to draw it over myself so I literally pulled it off her um, and and this feeling kind of came up my arms and over my body um, and I just carried on pulling it. So I was like, well, where, where am I going to send it now? You know, because I don't want to stick it back in the house. It's got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and because it was a bit of a critical situation, um, I literally sent it down into the centre of the earth in order to be kind of just... Um, to just ground it out. For. Yeah, or, or just to kind of transform that energy into into love was my visualisation, that it would be transformed into to something pure and beautiful by some kind of alchemical process as I as I sent it down into the centre of the earth, um, the earth being the closest thing to me because I was sitting on it. So this this feeling kind of intensified and and, and I'm holding onto her hands thinking, oh, you know, just kind of out of interest, you know, I wonder how strong this is going to get. Um, but it, it was okay. We managed. And, and I just kept drawing it off and drawing it off and drawing it off and sending it down into the earth. And then and then I felt that it was gone. And and I had been I'd, I'd not been looking at her during this time. I just kind of had my head bowed and I was looking down and, and she had her head bowed. And her, I think we both had our eyes shut. But but we both looked up at each other at exactly the same time. We both knew it was gone together. She felt that it was gone. I felt it was gone. And we just, you know, it was like something wonderful had happened. We both looked up at each other and I said, it's gone. You're fine. And she was fine and she could speak. And um, we made her eat some food to, you know, kind of like properly ground her and, you know, get her blood sugar up if she needed it. But, mm -hmm. um, and that was that. And the uh, the owners of the house reported that absolutely no problem that it felt lighter happier karen karen sorry i don't know why this is happening the owners <laughs> reported go to that okay so the owners reported that that after the cleansing after that had happened um they had no more problems uh, the house felt lighter it was brighter it had a much better happier more positive energy the children were happy again none of the rooms felt weird no ghosts were seen after that um and, and the problems were fixed. So, thankfully, we were able to help them. That's wonderful. You know, you mentioned raising vibrations. And mm. that gets me thinking about negative energy in a home. And, you know, like poltergeists, for instance, are not necessarily spirits. It could be some person in the home who's really troubled or conflicted. Or the whole family could be conflicted or having conflicts with one another. And there's an energy in the home already, and they they tap into that energy. And how can we help people? Um, what advice would you give people to help them to raise the vibrations? That is a situation that that I've dealt with quite a lot as a paranormal investigator, Chris. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you mentioned that and brought that up because I think that's a really important thing for people to be able to deal with. That when you go to a report of paranormal activity in the home, it isn't necessarily paranormal. Although, as I think we've already discussed between us, you know, I don't really like the term paranormal. I think it is actually normal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All of and these I things. agree with you. <laughs> um, 
that it, it could be, you know, something that isn't a haunting or, you know, demonic or of that nature. It could literally just be residual energy in the home. So <laughs> I, I've been and into a lot reaction of reaction too. Sorry, say again. And it's your reaction to that energy that helps it to manifest one way or the other. That's exactly right. You know, we go into these homes and you can see that there has been trouble in the home, that, you know, there might be, um, you know, holes that have been kicked or punched in doors or in walls. And it may not be the current tenants that are, you know, that have that have caused that damage that could be how the house was when they moved in so you know perhaps there was some kind of conflict or violence or anger or substance issues that were going on in that house that have left that kind of nasty aggressive negative energy behind and now the people that are living there are having to deal with it so so what do you do about that um like you said you know you've got to look at raising the vibrations of the home and the people who are in it as well and mm -hmm. um, this kind of activity can really bring people down um and and that makes you more vulnerable as well so even though it's not necessarily a ghost it can certainly have a real effect on people oh absolutely so i would i would start off with doing um an elemental cleansing as i as i normally would so this the blessed and consecrated salt and water and burning sage i would encourage people to physically clean their homes um, yeah. dirt and clutter don't make for a good atmosphere in a home if you physically clean your home you don't just appreciate the cleanliness of it if you're even partly sensitive you can tell that it feels better the energy is better in the home it it feels brighter and happier when the, you know whether that's the home that feels happier i don't know but the, the, it changes the energy so if there's a lot of clutter in the home <laughs> you kind of have to approach this a little bit delicately but you know <laughs> yeah i, I see it a lot to... in, not every case but i do see in many cases that the homes that have the the real bad phenomena taking place uh, the home is either very cluttered or just filthy. Mm. And by simply cleaning it, that's a, a big step forward. It makes a huge difference. And it, it links into the, you know, the Chinese belief system of feng shui, you know, feng the way shui. that the energy the can move. Thing. Oh, rats. I've been into a property. Karen. Karen. Yep, I'm back. <laughs> we, we did it again. Yep. yep. Sorry. Uh, so <laughs> I, I just agreed with you about feng shui. Okay. So, so yeah, it, it links in the, uh, the, the, the Chinese concept of feng shui, the, the way that the energy can move around the home. And mm -hmm. I've been into properties where they've been having real issues and you go into their living room and, and it's filled floor to ceiling with trinkets. Um, you know, you've got doilies on every surface and, and there's no space between the ornaments that are on there. And just, the, you know, and, and actually the home was beautifully clean. I mean, the work that they must have invested to dust all of these things. But it was just just the literal amount of stuff that they have there was um, it, it affected the, the energy of the home, the way that it flowed as well. And it also a very strange layout to that particular house that I'm thinking of as well, which had very odd energy flow mm -hmm. um so so decluttering physically cleaning the home i would encourage people who are in those situations to take care of themselves as well you've got to you've got to affect the energy of the property but you've got to also raise the vibration of the inhabitants as well so eating healthily steering clear of junk food you know nurture your body mm -hmm. eat you know, fresh fruit, vegetables, you know, if you eat meat, eat meat. Actually, better if you don't eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian, but actually it's a good way of raising your vibration is, is avoiding meat because it's actually a very grounding um, substance to eat. Yeah, it's funny. I was um, just speaking with a doctor uh, in another podcast, and she was talking about the importance of nutritional therapy, is, mm -hmm. and including in paranormal homes. And I agree with you. you. You need to increase the physical vibrations of your own body. Uh, you should, you know, play nice music. You should yeah. uh, watch comedies that make you laugh. You should make Brilliant. love. 
And exactly. if you're going to argue, go outside. Exactly. Have a party. Fill your, <laughs> fill, your, fill your home with friends and love and laughter. Bring in family. Have a meal together. Share good experiences in the home. Bring in high vibration crystals. Um, you know, Absolutely. avoid alcohol and drugs for sure. You know. uh, that you can do. Uh, all right, to stop again. Lift the vibration. Uh, avoid drugs, you said. Go from there. Yes. Um, avoid drugs, avoid alcohol. Um, there is so many raise the vibration of the property and yourself as well all of which are going to contribute towards kind of lifting yourself out of being affected by this energy which hopefully you can also help to remove by doing and, a cleansing you know, this is really important for people to understand it sounds very new age and very hoity-toity um maybe that's the wrong word uh or expression but <laughs> the reality is we are all energy and what we put out there we attract uh, my grandmother Absolutely. used to say, like attracts like. You know, if you're That's throwing right. out negative energy, you're going to attract negative things. That's very true. Very true. Um, you know, we, we um, were talking earlier about something fascinating to me. You know, this bad energy and how it can manifest. There's actually a way where certain traditions can create these entities. Yes. You mentioned one called an egregore. Egregores, yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you are a witch or a magician, um, one of the things that you might want to do is create something called a servitor. So it's a, a manufactured entity which you use to do your bidding. Um, and another name for that is an egregore. So it's, it's something that you create from your own will and your own input of energy to, to create this being. Now, there's risks associated with creating an energetic entity. Um, one of those is that it doesn't do your bidding, uh, in which case you have to immediately destroy it and make another one that does, because um, your first one obviously malfunctioned. The second point is that the more tasks you give these things and the more energy you put into them, they, they feed off that. So they can grow in strength and power so you don't want this to kind of grow beyond your means your ability to control it so you put an expiration date on them maybe a year and a day and you say after this date you know it's going to be destroyed you destroy the physical vessel which you've made which contains the components that you've used to create it um, which is an important part of the process you destroy that and then you destroy it energetically as well so it's terminated beyond that point um, so it's an egregore to all intents and purposes. It could be a ghost. You could describe it as the demon. If you know lost, to lost you again. Uh, so oh, from poo. for all intents and purposes, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, it could be a ghost. Start with yeah. that. So for all intents and purposes, you could describe this thing as a ghost or a demon or a spirit but it's something that you manufactured yourself. And this isn't something that only a witch or a, a wizard could do. This is something that people can do by accident. People can do it by accident. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, you wouldn't be kind of sitting there, um, you know, watching something on TV, <laughs> you know, your, your old rerun of Friends or something, and then you find you've accidentally no, created no. a demon in your living room. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but but, but it, it does happen. I've been into properties where they think that it's being haunted by a ghost. And maybe it is, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just residual energy that they're picking up on, and, and that could have been their initial problem. But by the time I go in there, they've decided that they've got a ghost, and they've given it a name. So now they're talking to Harry, who's in their house. And, you know, there'll be a noise or something happens. Oh, that's Harry. Talking about Harry, talking to Harry, the whole family are feeding in to this concept mm -hmm. this ghost that they've created called harry they're pouring energy into it and if it's frightening them 
they're putting their energy of fear into it as well, which adds a, a lovely negative tone <laughs> to the whole occasion. And they're actually creating an egregore. They're creating a haunting where perhaps one didn't exist in the first place. The first thing we say to them is, stop using the name. Don't, you know, don't, you're, you're actually exacerbating the issue inadvertently. You're making it worse. You have to stop using the name, you know, stop thinking about it in those terms because otherwise you're pro propagating the issue. And even if we do a cleansing and a banishing and you still start, keep talking about Harry, Harry's going to be back <laughs> mm -hmm. because you're creating Harry. So it's, it's an important thing to know. Absolutely. I mean, whether it be a poltergeist or or something else, the reality is, and I, I've seen this all over the world, you know, we manifest the phenomena based on our preconceptions. You're, you're not going to get a Christian demon in a Hindu family. It's going to manifest as a Hindu style demon. Mm. Uh, and people don't, you know, most people don't understand that. Is it an... I, I'm, I will be happy to admit, at the end of the day, I don't know what a demon is. You know, yeah. I, I have ideas. I, I know how to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. and, and every culture in the world has ways of dealing with these entities. But what they are in reality, I'm not positive. I do know that we always need to look at the underlying problems in the, in the household. Because there's something that made that family or that individual vulnerable to this negativity. And yes. if we don't take care of that, then this thing is going to end up coming back or something else will be drawn to them. Absolutely. It's kind of a real pastoral care situation. You know, you've got to deal with the problems at hand, but you have to deal with the the environmental conditions that facilitated that in the first place. Yeah. Um, Holistic otherwise just approach. Kind of Holistic approach. Otherwise, you're just putting a sticking plaster over a broken leg and <laughs> you might have stemmed the flow of blood temporarily, but you haven't really dealt with the underlying issue. <laughs> exactly. You know, we could go on for literally hours because I, I know we've barely scratched the surface on even the topics that we've just talked about. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I, I would love to have you come back and talk with me again. I'd love to. Great. But in the meantime... If people are looking for help and they are in New Zealand, how can they find you? How can they get that help? Probably the quickest way of contacting us is through our Facebook page. So Haunted New Zealand has a, a, has a, a Facebook page. So it's just facebook.com forward slash haunted NZ. Um, you can uh, shoot us a private message through that Facebook page um, and, uh, and we'll get straight back to you. Um, I mean, even if you just want to get in touch with us to tell us your own paranormal experiences we love we love hearing about people's paranormal stories um we've had people who have contacted us just because they want to offload you know they've they've had these awful experiences from childhood nobody believed them they've been carrying them around for years sometimes they just need somebody to talk to about it so that they right. can feel believed and and relieved of these issues um you know if you want to do that that's fine you know message us we'll talk to you and it's important for our clients to also understand that your anonymity is extremely important to us. We're not going to share your personal details with the world. You know, if you come to us and you need help, then you're safe with us. Absolutely. I mean, anything that's anything that's said to us is is said in complete confidence. Um, you know, professionalism is is of paramount importance and discretion as well. You know, these are really difficult situations that people are dealing with. And but by the time people get to a point where they're looking for a paranormal investigator to help them, they're really desperate. You know, and that's not a, that's not an easy thing to do to reach out to somebody like that and say, hey, no. look, you know these things are going on in my home and it really tends to be a last resort so you know we we take that really seriously we know the suffering that these situations can cause we've spoken to families been in families where you know the whole family are, are sleeping in the living room 
the adults and the children all together because they're right. so fearful of sleeping in their own room or being upstairs at night time. And you know, that's real genuine suffering in those situations. So, you know, we're sensitive to that. We understand that. Um, you know, that's that's not for public consumption. We're here to yes. help with those situations. And if anybody uh, can't find her for some reason, uh, you can always go to the Warren Legacy Foundation Facebook page or to www.warrenfiles.com and get in touch with her there. All of her contact information is there. Karen Tibbetts-Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. And folks, I hope you will join us next week for another episode of The Warren Files. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.